it is my tremendous honor to welcome you, our distinguished audience, and to collaborate with our expert panelists to chair this most intriguing and exciting virtual roundtable discussion titled The Greatest Generational Wealth Transfer in World History is Now. This is on behalf of the prestigious Harassus Asia Meeting 2021. Look, to elaborate a little bit and give some more context uh, to this discussion, the purpose of this virtual roundtable panel is due to there being a substantial flow of funds and private wealth transfer occurring over the forthcoming generation from the baby boomers to the next generation inheritors, uh, particularly in Asia and globally. However, there's often a, a, a bit of a mystique or a lack of understanding of the key trends that will play a major role uh, going forward, particularly in also including the values, interests and areas of focus that the next generation may, may decide to take. Look, one statistic alone uh, to, 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 to elaborate upon the enormity of this states that uh, by 2060 in the US alone, 68 trillion will transfer from one generation to the next. And this is a truly monumental situation. But look, at the apex of this phenomenon is the top 1% comprising the ultra high net worth community and the family office communities and their next generation inheritors which are often the most misunderstood and least accessible of all investor categories, particularly single family offices. Now, just to uh, clarify, a family office is a, a family who has a uh, investable assets of a hundred million US dollars or more, which are set to the business and operating businesses, um, which are comprised also their net worth. And also uh, for a ultra high net worth individual, generally it is an individual with 30 million US dollars in net worth or above. But just to give a taste of the enormity of the wealth transfer, here's some just key statistics that usually um, shocks people by the, the amount of, of, of actual funds available. There's in excess of 10 trillion in assets amongst family officers alone, and this amount is clearly growing. I would actually speculate that there's substantially more than this uh, because many uh, family offices are not necessarily categorizing themselves as family offices and not necessarily um, coming up in some of these studies. Wealth X, for example, also states the combined uh, global net worth is approximately 35.5 trillion as far as the ultra high net worth community. Now, just let that settle in 35.5 trillion, which I assume uh, also means that uh, it is unleveraged money. According to Wealth Society, and this is an, an, an interesting component as well, is 85% uh, of Asia's billionaires are still founders of their family businesses. So it shows that there's, there's still a, quite a vibrant uh, operating culture of entrepreneurship that has become new wealth as part of the, the existing transfer of wealth and what will flow in future years. But uh, a key, key component as well is 40% of family offices in Asia Pacific are engaged in sustainable investing compared to 34% globally, um, with millennials increasingly taking the helm of these family uh, businesses. And I, I've noticed that a lot as well with regards to um, Asian businesses I've come across, where many are, are very much intertwined into the uh, communities of which they, they serve. And a key component to also consider is the forthcoming era of the virtual global citizen is, is clearly upon us due to technology transfers and, and advancements, which is also going to provide that interconnectedness between Asia and the Western world. But so uh, without further ado, and to answer some of those burning questions you may have, it's my pleasure to share with you the description of our roundtable panel, which is the greatest generational wealth transfer in world history is now. The global and Asian communities of millennial inheritors are known to be ESG conscious, tech savvy, and lead the charge of this tidal wave of generational wealth transfer. What are the values, vision, and objectives of this more socially focused 1% in Asia and internationally? Will the direction of this new breed of private wealth leaders galvanize a new order of positive social impact and greater wealth in, uh, distribution? So look, with that, without further ado, we'll uh, introduce our distinguished panelists. Firstly, um, coming from the uh, United Kingdom, but with a substantial background in Asia, is Professor Bob Garrett, who's Director of Good Governance Development Limited. Welcome, Bob. Thank you. 
And I'll say ni hao and salam hagi to our and listeners. <laughs> <laughs> Very much you're welcome. And um, Pamela Lau, who is Ambassador for Community Sponsors Charity in Indonesia. Welcome, Pamela. Hi, good morning. Thank you, Peter. Such an honor to be here. And uh, also say uh, selamat pagi, uh, good morning, Zhou-san, to all the uh, participants of Horasis um, Asia meeting today. It's lovely to be here. And honored to have you. Um, now, our other, other panelists that were scheduled to join us, which is uh, Hong Nguyen, who is a director of WLC Group, uh, a family office out of Singapore, and also uh, Fong C. Nguyen, who is a director of WLC uh, family office out of Vietnam. Unfortunately, we've had uh, some technical difficulties and COVID has prevented them from joining us right now, but they may join us um, at, at some stage during this discussion. But look, uh, what I think is, is, is really important to, to frame uh, the context for all of our, our audience here today, um, we'd very much in, enjoy hearing a little bit more about your backgrounds, uh, what led you to becoming in, interested in and affiliated with the Great Wealth Transfer. So, Bob, I'd love to hear more about uh, your story and what led you, led you to, to, to where we are today. Well, thank you. Um, yes, I'm not a typical um, uh, corporate governance person in the sense that I'm not terribly interested in the codes and the development of such things. I'm, um, I come from an architecture background originally and a problem-solving uh, background in terms of large-scale organizational change and uh, I just got puzzled as to why the people at the very top of organizations the directors often had very little background in design and making the future happen so I started writing about it and suddenly found sort of 30 years later I'm meant to be a guru in the area which I have some doubts about but at least I have eight books behind me now and a lot of track record so um, I'm very interested in uh, what directors do rather than what managers do. And uh, the uh, surprise to me is about 95% of organizations around the world, and I work on five of the six continents, um, have very little clue as to what the people at the very top are meant to be doing. And that in terms of giving direction to organizations, and that includes governments as well as um, the private sector and the not-for-profit sector. Um, so I've just been developing my own theories and theses and used very practically because all my stuff is based on practice. Um, it's what people actually do around the boardroom table and how they look out into the environment, how they scan it and how they then bring it in to give effective direction to their business. Mm -hmm. no, thank you very much, Bob. We look forward to hearing more of your views uh, very shortly. And Pamela, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your, your background and um, areas of focus and what led you to be interested in the Great Wealth uh, Transfer. Well, uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, my background is uh, mostly in uh, public relations. I've been a, a public relations professional for more than 25 years. Um, most of my professional experience has been in Indonesia, where I have worked on uh, various public relations campaigns with the president of Indonesia. I was also the creator of the Indonesian tourism mascot, which I used the Komodo dragon, which I thought was very unique. Just like um, Australia, they have the um, kangaroo koala bear as their mascot and uh, uh, China will use panda. I thought the Komodo dragon was very unique to Indonesia and could be used to promote the diversity and uh, you know the uh, exoticness of Indonesia. So that I did. Uh, for the uh, 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 previous uh, president, the late um, Mr. Abu Rahman Wahid. And um, because of my interest in uh, green projects uh, and uh, green economy, I also built the uh, first uh, green bus shelter for uh, Trans Jakarta Busway. Uh, that was uh, in Jakarta, and I put solar panels uh, on the uh, uh, Trans Jakarta Busway, and that was uh, very good, and that was a project with the current president, uh, Mr. Joko Widodo. Now, with regards to the uh, great wealth transfer, why, the reason why I'm here is because um, I was inspired over 10 years ago by uh, the um, very exciting Giving Pledge campaign and initiative uh, for this very exclusive Billionaires Club, I think, you know, a lot of uh, people in our participants and audience may be familiar with it. And that's the pledge that started by uh, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, where they invite uh, fellow billionaires to donate 
more than 50% of their net worth for charity and for, you know, philanthropic um, programs. So because I've had such an extensive experience, professional experience, I gravitated towards that. And uh, that's why now I focus uh, quite a lot of my time uh, towards uh, this type of um, uh, philanthropic pursuits and to giving back. And that's why I've um, um, been um, very honored to be an ambassador of Community Sponsor Charity, which is a charity that was set up in the UK more than 15 years ago. And what they do is cherry pick certain charities to support and fundraise for. This way, we have across the board of different sectors of charity that we can help, you know, whether it's uh, climate change, education, school children, food, and things like that. So we're not just focused in one sector. So that's why um, my uh, presentation or, or what I discuss will more have a more philanthropic uh, angle uh, towards the great wealth transfer. Because I like to put into the practice of saying that um, in your youth, you spend your time accumulating wealth. In the prime of your life, you would spend your time cultivating that wealth. And towards the end of your life, you will spend that time giving away all that wealth. So I think that's very good wisdom and uh, I like to practice it. Yeah, thank you. Very good wisdom indeed, Pamela, indeed. <laughs> Um, another another point is, of course, is what, and I'll direct this one towards you, you, Bob, is what do you feel are the values, responsibilities, and the role of the top 1% of all inheritors, what they presently play today in Asia in comparison to the West? And how do you think this differs between sort of a patriarchal generation as opposed to the next generation? Because, uh, again, Bob, you've had the, the power of, of really living in, in Asia for so many years, and also the Western can give that comparison. So, yeah, firstly... Um, Again, the comparison between uh, the top 1% in Asia and, uh, and the West and the differences between patriarchs and next generation. All right. OK, a question I wasn't expecting, but I will now <laughs> respond as best I can. Um, yes, my uh, initial experience was, uh, to say the least, very strange. It was 1976 um, with the Communist Party in China, uh, just before the um, death of Mao and the earthquake and everything else and the fall of the Gang of Four. So I spent um, some time, um, just a couple of people away from Deng Xiaoping, as he was trying to develop the whole notion of opening up the Chinese economy and the four modernizations. So in one sense, that's the 1% I started with. It's a very particular 1%. Um, and then since then, I'm working with a, a lot of other Asian families, a lot of Western families. I think the biggest... Um, uh, two, two issues uh, come out of that. One is understanding what I suggested in my introductory chat, the, um, the, the careful differentiation of who is a director and what their task is. I mean, in, in one sense, and if you look at the 54 Commonwealth countries where the law is very clear in this area, um, the role of the director is to do two things. On the one hand, um, to, to give direction to the organization so that the organization continues as a healthy entity. So showing direction, moving ahead, scanning the horizon, but on the other hand, to keep it under prudent control. And the role of the director in Asia or the West, if you want to make that crude distinction, um, is how to balance and rebalance that on a very regular basis, by which I mean a, an absolute minimum of once a month, not a quarterly or a half yearly board meeting, but it's a 24-7 a full-time um, intellectual job, even if you don't actually um, get paid for 24-7. Um, but the other pressure that's coming on at the moment, and I certainly see it growing very rapidly in the West and in the Caribbean at the moment, and now in the Gulf, the Arabian Gulf, um, and I hear it from my Asian colleagues, is that whereas before the focus, and it's very true in the top 1% families, had um, always had a strong financial aspect to it. I'm not saying totally fixated, but a strong financial aspect to it. Um, in the philanthropic and in other areas of their family work, they've had a conscience. And what I see happening at the moment in the West particularly is as ESG and other pressures come on those families, um, the uh, balance between financial performance, which is necessary, um, and conscience, um, as to how we impact the world, particularly in terms of environmental and social, is growing very rapidly indeed. Mm -hmm. 
No, thank you very much, Bob. There was um, uh, some, some some very very uh, interesting sort of uh, takeaways from that 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 uh, that discussion. Uh, and also the same for yourself, Pamela. What do you feel are the, the values, the responsibilities of the top 1% of all inheritors that they're presently in, playing in Asia in comparison to the West? And um, how do you feel these differ between the patriarchs and the next gens? Okay. Um, I think um, uh, for me, the comparison uh, is not so much between the East and the West. Um, mm. For me, the yeah. responsibilities and values of the inheritors is actually to preserve that wealth. I mean, it's one thing trying to accumulate mm. it and mm. actually mm. another thing trying to keep it. Mm. Uh, most people have the misconception that the hardest part is to make money, but actually it's not. Uh, making money and accumulating it is only one mm. part. To preserve mm. it um, mm. is something else altogether. Mm. Now, we're not even talking about increasing it, right? Just to keep it as it mm. is, is, mm. is not easy. And I think this um, responsibility falls on the second generation or the next generation uh, is because they have, uh, you know, the um, uh, task of making sure that uh, what the wealth has been accumulated by the previous generation is kept in the family and is used wisely and, uh, you know, it's used uh, to protect the family's legacy and, and name. So that means that they have to be very careful in certain things that they invest in. You know, obviously, um, in certain uh, industries such as uh, gambling or even, um, you know, CBD or things like that can, in some uh, cases, have, uh, you know, uh, uh, negative connotations. So that's why the next generation have to be very careful what to do with their wealth and to make sure that they're investing in uh, sectors and businesses that, uh, let's say, for example, their previous generations would approve of. So that's my take on it. Yeah. Indeed. And also, I'll, I'll, I'll put another question to you now, uh, Pamela. Like, from your own mm-hmm. unique perspective uh, and interest, what do you feel is the most appropriate direction forward? The next generation in Asia and internationally should take when it comes to positive social impact, financial stability, uh, and greater wealth distribution over this coming transfer of wealth. Well, um, to be positive uh, is uh, in uh, some ways quite uh, subjective. Uh, it, it depends on really which way you uh, look at it. But I think uh, the uh, one of the best ways to make impact. Mm-hmm. Uh, in social investment is if the next generation can invest more in such thing as basic research and also in emerging uh, technologies such as AI and also to invest in um, research and uh, projects that uh, um, can, um, you know, bring to light risk to humanity. And the reason is because a lot of companies don't have the luxury of extra funds and capital to spend on research. Uh, because, you know, obviously one of their most important goals is to make profits and to, you know, make their shareholders happy. Whereas from a family office, that uh, accumulating uh, wealth and profits, uh, the pressure of that is taken off slightly. And so they don't really have that many shareholders that they have to appease, right? So they can spend, uh, they can afford to have the luxury to spend their uh, funds and their wealth in a lot of research and investments, which may take years or never to see any returns. And the next generation is also more uh, adventurous and curious and to see, you know, what effects that their funds uh, can have if it's put to good use and they would like to use their funds to gain insight and knowledge, whereas the previous generations would want their funds to to build and to accumulate. So that's where I see, uh, you know, the main differences. And that's how the next generation uh, can really make an impact and influence um by investing a lot of research and getting answers for things that we don't have today. No, very insightful there, particularly, and, and we'll touch on it perhaps a little later, particularly the role of entrepreneurship and innovation. Yes. That's Thank so you. important to this next generation um, mm-hmm. and, 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 and how it's going to affect, of course, our global internet interconnectivity with one another. And, and Bob, really um, extending off of that, uh, again, uh, what role can governance play for these key issues that uh, Pam uh, discussed, you know, social impact, financial stability, greater wealth distribution? Uh, what role can governance play on these issues? And what are some differences between Asia and the West that you, you foresee? 
Um, well, the well, first of all, I totally agree with what Pamela has just said. I think that's spot on um, uh, about the next generation. Um, so I'm going to make two points. Um, one is, if you like, the shadow side of what Pamela is talking about, which is very positive, and I'm all, all for that. That's what I'm about. But the shadow side I'm finding, and I notice this at the moment, for example, particularly in the Arabian Gulf, with some of the very large families there um, who are running into third generation issues right now. But I've seen this reflected in other parts of the world and certainly in um, uh, uh, Southeast Asia, um, is that the third generation doesn't necessarily want very much to do with the business. Mm -hmm. And that's very tricky because they still have usually substantial holdings in the business. But they've either decided that they want a, an easier life whereby um, they'll take a, a quite a large sum of money a year um, as, as an income from the uh, business, but don't really want to participate and certainly don't want to be an active board member uh, on the one hand. Or <clears throat> they've gone off on their own to develop their own activities and therefore they're a nominal or what I call an accidental um, director in the family um, office or in, in a number of the family businesses. Um, and that's a, a very interesting phenomenon that, that's beginning to develop because in governance terms, unless they really want to play an active directing role, then one has to um, try and bring in others who will but by definition, they will not be family members. And that sets up all sorts of other tensions, not just in the immediate family, but in the extended family, who also will have um, uh, ownership, um, of usually of uh, shares, etc. So there are all sorts of interesting tensions there. But the essence of it, I think, is uh, be between the East and the West, is that we still have to make sure there are people who spend time looking out over the horizon, trying to understand what the trends are, and then moving the um, uh, accumulated resources um, in a direction that both protects the, the wealth of the family, the health of the businesses, and allows this growing um, impact <coughs> side, especially but not exclusively, in terms of the environment and the community um, activities. Um, to, to thrive as well. Um, it, it's becoming really quite a major uh, job. And I use the term carefully. It is really a piece of work now. It's not just a, a notional thing. It's not just the ability to um, uh, have a, uh, a state of grandeur by being a director of or whatever, but it's actually a proper piece of work. And um, I think that in um, Southeast Asia particularly, we're beginning to see the start of people saying it is actually a professional activity. We've seen it to an extent in the UK. We've seen it to an extent in Australia. We're just beginning to see um, it in the Gulf, particularly through the Gulf Corporation Council, who, who are setting up. And we're just beginning to see the start of that with the nine nations in the Caribbean. Um, so uh, the, these, um, the, these trends are, are moving um, and the family dynamics of that um, are very complex at the moment because you've got, as you suggested uh, earlier, you've got the founding generation normally and you've normally got the second generation who tend to take a, a slightly more managerial sort of stewardship approach uh, to the um, preservation of the, uh, the wealth. But, but now you've got a third generation appearing on a number of continents who are either, uh, as I suggested earlier, not really taking the job um, uh, seriously, but want the income, or um, are finding their parallel tracking with their own professional development. So it's complex. Mm -hmm. at the moment. Yeah, indeed. Very good point you make, Bob. I mean, there is a saying in the family office uh, industry of shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, but usually, uh, and again, there's different studies, but there's one major study that actually states that uh, around only 10% of the wealth reaches the third generation and 5% of the wealth reach the, reaches the fourth generation. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and part of that is, of course, that, that discontinuity. But if there is that proper governance structure where there is a family mm -hmm. constitution, yeah. 
where there is participation and it is very clear what the role and the responsibilities of all family members are. Um, and that is, that is obviously key. The other component is, of course, with fa family officers, if we look at that and the ultra high net worth community, it's very fragmented and there are different levels of sophistication. They may have made their money, for example, operating a business such as uh, it could be in real estate, it could be in farming, it could be in retail. Mm. And when they exit and become essentially a professional financial management uh, family office, mm. they don't necessarily have that sort of skill set. Mm. So different mm. answer of skills and it's whether or not the next gen are interested in that or wish to pursue their own things. Mm. So uh, moving forward, um, I'll, I'll direct this one to you, Pamela. Are there any misconceptions, trends, or key points that you feel are important to share with the audience that they may want to be aware of regarding the next generation uh, and the great wealth transfer in Asia or, uh, or globally? Okay, well, as you know, I'm coming from an angle, a philanthropic angle, uh, with my uh, take on the great wealth transfer. So my biggest um, um, misconception that I think a lot of people have is that they think you have to have a lot of money to do philanthropic work. Mm. And I'm telling you, that is not the case at all. People think, okay, when I have more, then I can give more and I have more time. But that is not true. So I give you a case in point. Uh, one of the charities that we are supporting and we are highlighting is uh, United World Schools. And that is a really amazing charity that we have selected to support. In fact, we're doing a big sub fundraising for them at the next family office event on the 9th of December. And this charity, uh, which was founded on the very humble beginnings, um, is uh, focused on providing education for uh, children in rural areas. Mm -hmm. And in a very short time, they have managed to build over 200 schools and have given free education to over 50,000 children uh, in areas such as Cambodia and Nepal, who would otherwise have no access at all to um, education. And the way this has been funded is by, believe it or not, other school children. So, I mean, and these school children, I mean, I, I love talking about them, right? And mm. they are start from ages as young as four. So if school children who are still studying and don't have any means of acquiring wealth, they can still do charity work and mm. philanthropic work. So that means you don't really have need to have money to be able to do that. All you need is to have good intention, time, and, uh, you know, and uh, a reason for, for wanting to do it. So that is um, what I would like to say. So for anybody out there who thinks that, uh, oh, I need to have more money before I can do it. No, I think take the examples. I mean, if I had more time, I would love to highlight a few of the children and what they have done uh, to fundraise for other school children and to build schools. And I think that's really good. Yeah. Thank you. No, in, indeed, indeed. And are, are there any sort of key lessons? Uh, I'll put this one to you, Bob. Uh, are there any key lessons you've learned from your experience or another's family dynamics or from the, the many parties that you've, you've advised over the years that it, you feel has brought positive collaboration and change to the family, the business or the community? Oh, gosh, um, quite a lot. Um, I think the most difficult is the diffusion of the concept of ownership from the second generation to the third um, and the way in which that plays out. Now, the only way I've ever seen this done particularly successfully is to have um, actually quite a powerful figure who grabs this issue by the throat and says, to the extended family, which can then run into over 100 people, maybe more. Um, listen, folks, unless we get this right, there ain't going to be a fourth generation. Well, there's not going to be fourth generation wealth. So um, what I've seen done there um, is the pulling together of family school at various things, but a family parliament mm -hmm. where people are brought together um, everybody who has literally a share in, in the family share in, in the business brought together and literally locked in, usually over a long weekend somewhere in the world, normally in a very grand place. Um, but the family and their families are not allowed to go outside the grounds. 
uh, whilst it's discussed as to do we continue in the way we've done or do we begin to, uh, it's a difficult word, professionalize the business um, in such a way that we can take what we want out of it. The family wealth is, uh, continues and develops. Um, the spin-off from that can be used in whichever way you think um, appropriate, um, some of which will certainly be philanthropic. Um, and uh, we, we don't risk this uh, possible train wreck of the third generation uh, appearing. Now, that's not necessarily pure governance, but it's what I see as uh, a pattern that repeats itself around the world and is uh, very dangerous. And I think it also wastes a huge amount of energy and a huge amount of um, accumulated wealth in trying to resolve it, because otherwise you end up with long-lasting family feuds. Um, and uh, even though you have an apparently very professional office at the center of it, um, these things can go on for you know, decade after decade. So it's a, it's a, a difficult area. It needs both a lot of subtlety and yet a very strong hand at the center of it to try and just say this is an issue for the family. Mm. Mm, indeed. And Pamela, yeah, have you got any further thoughts on that, on just key lessons you've learned from your experience and another, say, family dynamics or the, or the different uh, groups that you've been involved with and advised that's po brought positive collaboration and change amongst that family or amongst that group? Uh, because you've dealt with family, charity, government, all of that. So you're, I'd love your thoughts on that. Okay, well, my biggest um, take on that is lead by example. Mm. I believe in being the leader and taking the initiative. And I think that's the um, uh, main thing of how families can influence each other. And I'm coming back to my example as uh, the giving pledge. This is a great example of how billionaires can influence other billionaires. And it started from um, only two billionaires now to up to over last check was 211 billionaires who signed a pledge to give over 50% uh, of their wealth. And that's the numbers is 10, that's over 10% of the total billionaires in the world, which is now estimated at about 2000. So to get over 200 of that, that's over 10% already. So as I said, um, to be the uh, lead by example. So if you want other people to do uh, what you think is right, the most important thing is to do it yourself. And mm. that's how the uh, uh, families uh, influence each other because they see what other families has done and uh, they would like to, you know, be part of it as well. So yeah, that's my main take on it. Mm. Yeah. And following up, up, up on that as well, Pat, I mean, what role do you feel entrepreneurship, technology, social impact, philanthropy, creativity, a global outlook and, and other endeavors independent of the family plays in the life of the next generation. And are the next gens encouraged and given the freedom to explore the options uh, by the patriarchal generation from what you've seen? Uh, yeah, I think um, uh, coming back to that, I think technology has been a big uh, game changer in that. And uh, as I said, coming back to uh, my philo uh, philanthropical approach, uh, in the great wealth transfer and looking at it from a more uh, uh, global uh, and uh, macro perspective. Now, with um, websites such as uh, GoFundMe, Just Giving and Virgin Giving, mm -hmm. donating has been so much easier and it's more uh, fundraising and it's more common now. Uh, we can see that by the amount of uh, funds that has uh, uh, been, been raised uh, to date. And uh, now, uh, whereas uh, previous generations... Um, even if they wanted to do fundraising, it would be, you know, quite difficult for them. They would have to go to their favorite charities or they would have to send a check or they would have to wait for door to door collections. Now, with this new generation, all they have to do is to log on and they can follow their favorite charities and to see what, um, you know, which sector that they want to uh, participate in. And another thing is very common now to find that a lot of uh, these uh, run uh, fundraising charities being done on social media. And uh, they like to follow the progress of the fund that they've um, um, yeah. invested in and donated it and see the impact of what they can do uh, with the funds that they've raised. So I think now technology has been the real game changer in the new generation of um, transfer of wealth in terms of philanthropical activities.
Yeah, and, and to elaborate on that, Bob, I mean, what context do you feel governance presently plays in the furtherment of these and re requires further consideration and implementation going into the future for the next gens uh, if they are going to be given the freedom um, to or encouraged to explore new things? Well, a, a general point on corporate governance. Um, it, it's now become pretty fashionable, or at least the phrase has. Um, the practice is rather odd, and the practice has been taken over really not from the boardroom tables so much, but has been imposed by governments and regulators, and increasingly so, and you see it in South, Southeast Asia, um, but you see it in the Gulf, you see it elsewhere, um, whereby we're developing more and more codes, which are for the most part written either by or in the style of a civil servant, who is not a practitioner. And what worries me at the moment is that governance is being dragged off down a regulatory route when um, the whole essence of the family businesses especially is that they're entrepreneurial. That's how they started, that's how they thrive, that's how they develop. And they spin off in very creative ways. They don't, don't follow you know, an absolute, totally ruthlessly um, uh, financially orientated line and uh, you know, all about... Uh, shareholder supremacy and all that stuff, which is now pretty much discredited um, after 50 years. But they, um, they're, they're, they're trying to um, uh, develop, I think, in the families and in a lot of the wider um, uh, uh, companies, uh, an approach where you balance now uh, the financial against these other beneficial inputs. And I, for, for, for the sake of... Uh, brevity, I'll just say essentially environmental and community impact. But you have to beware because you see it beginning to happen. It's happening in Asia a bit. It's happening in Africa more at the moment. It's certainly happening in a few other parts of the world where governments are not only trying to impose um, uh, codes, many of which are copied out of the UK um, without really thinking about them, um, not only impose codes, but this this whole issue of what's called licenses to operate, which is at a national level. So whereas the entrepreneurial first and second generations can be um, great at creating the future, um, we're, we're hitting some barriers now where the third generations um, are hit on the one hand by, do I really want to do this? On another hand by... Um, uh, the ESG uh, pressures, and then if you can have three hands, bad metaphor from my side, um, but on the third hand, um, our government's now beginning to say, you can only operate in within our um, jurisdiction for a fixed period of time, um, which we specify, and with certain outputs um, that we specify, um, and that is... Uh, going to, I think, be a major governance issue over the next two decades. Um, the, the, the notion that you don't, you no longer have unlimited uh, life, unlimited size, unlimited license, um, and therefore unlimited power with, within a corporation, particularly a large one. Uh, and that, that'll cause the third gens to really have to think about the way they're going to balance the development of wealth, the accumulation, as uh, Paris said earlier, the, um, uh, the consolidation or the uh, preservation of that, and then the distribution of that. And I think the, the formula will be rather different than it, it has been, where we've had a lot of freedom up, up to now. Yes, indeed. And so, so, it, it, there's so many key issues there. We're, it's a shame we don't have more time because we've also mm. talked about the, entre the role of entrepreneurship. Yeah. Yeah. plus ESG, and I also look at the economic returns mm. plus entrepreneurship plus ESG because mm. in order for the ESG to really scale uh, at the institutional level the and, and for some families to, to even a larger part of their mm. portfolio, economic returns need to be there. Uh, look, uh, look, we're, we're going to sort of uh, wind this up uh, to a close fairly soon. So, look, uh, in 30 seconds, as a special gift and insight just for our audience here at Harassus, uh, Pamela, if you had to pick one, or maximum two key insights you feel are most important uh, about either the patriarchal generation or the next gen's perspective, focus, mindset um, on the great wealth transfer, uh, what would that be? 
And what would you like to leave them with? Yeah, well, my biggest insight is um, now there has been a mindset change, which is very good, mm. which was a previous mindset was um, changed from one of scarcity to now to one of abundance, giving back and preservation. So whereas the previous generation focus was all about accumulation of wealth, the new generation is about giving back, especially to mm. nature and to what, uh, you know, uh, nature can can give back, yeah, can give to us. So uh, the new generation has a lot of focus on uh, green, uh, green projects, community based and community minded. Uh, previous generation may have taken a lot from Asia, uh, from nature, you know, in um, maybe you know forestation, mining, and that sort of uh, industries. Now the new generation mindset is to give back to the earth by focusing on maybe initiative like planting trees, clean water, protecting corals, saving mangroves and fighting for climate change. So I think this mindset is actually very, very good. So that is my big insight with my observation from um, whereas the previous generation has invested in um, you know, extracting from nature, the new generation is investing in giving back to nature. Thank you very much, Pamela. And, and, and roughly 30 seconds to a minute, Bob, uh, the same thing. Your one to, uh, to two key insights you feel uh, you'd like to share as relates to governance and the great wealth transfer. Okay. Um, well, you can't predict the future, but you can create it in your terms. And that's why I would link to what Pamela's just said. But I think you can now create it in this new, uh, again, for brevity, ESG uh, world, which is a lot about balancing wealth creation with giving back indeed yeah. can i add one more insight and this uh, is uh, 20 seconds insight. okay my biggest insight is to pay it forward caring is sharing so the more you give mm. the more you mm. get back mm. and that is the fundamental law of nature mm. now mm. if i can take it again coming back to my example uh which is the live uh, the giving pledge when uh warren buffett and uh, bill gates started that 10 years ago they had significantly less wealth than what they have today. So it mm -hmm. proves that this formula of paying it forward, the more you give, the more you get, mm -hmm. actually works. So mm -hmm. I would say that, um, you know, another honorable uh, mention to Mackenzie Scott, who has do uh, donated a lot mm -hmm. and over up to uh, 4 billion. And I would like the next generation to be able to do that as well. So that is my big yeah. sense. Said with passion, and I, I certainly <laughs> certainly look forward to seeing that uh, in the next generation and going forward. Look, uh, we're going to uh, wind this up to a close now. But look, ladies and gentlemen, in summary, you've gained many unique sites and perspectives on the greatest generational wealth transfer in history is now directly uh, from the experts themselves, uh, from very diverse backgrounds and international experience. We've gained greater insight into their perspectives on if the next generation's role as a top 1% of all inheritors in Asia or globally will lead to positive social impact, financial stability and greater wealth distribution. We've also learned about how the next gen differs from the patriarchal generation, the legacy and the positive impact each wishes to instill and to leave behind uh, for the community and the future generation. Uh, and my favourite part of the discussion, that one special takeaway insight shared by each one of our, our distinguished experts. Look, we strongly encourage uh, all of our distinguished audience to take action with this tremendous knowledge uh, going forward and provided today and welcome interaction and collaboration, which has made Harassus so successful over the years. Therefore, if there are any further thoughts or questions, you're welcome to reach out to Harassus directly. Alternately, you can uh, reach me directly on via email at inquiries, that's with an E, at adosinvestments.com, that's A-E-T-O-S, investments.com, um, or LinkedIn at Peter, J-R-A-Y-L-W-I-N, or via our website. And of course, our distinguished panelists via their social media and details provided with their bios. This concludes the greatest generational wealth transfer in history is now virtual roundtable discussion. I'd like to thank our panelists, uh, Pamela and Bob, uh, for their really valuable contributions, the committed staff of Harassus, and particularly Harassus Chairman Frank Jurgen Richter, uh, whose, in, whose uh, continued support has made this engaging roundtable possible. So, ladies and gentlemen, and distinguished guests, I wish you great success. 
prosperity and safety and a most exciting weekend. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. That was great. Really enjoyed it. And thank you, Bob. Lovely to, to well, have Thank you. you. I'm sure we'll meet again. We'll talk again. Definitely. And I've learned a lot from you today. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>